squeezing. Good. How are you? <laughs> That's okay. Hey, Heather's Ready? Where you want me? Wherever you'd are like you to be. Now? Yeah, we are. Oh, all right. Hi. Where's you in the fan? All right. Hi, I'm Heather. I'm a fellow veteran, and I'm in recovery myself. I'm a certified recovery specialist at Turning Point Alternative Living Solutions. I want to introduce our guest speaker tonight, Amber Viola. She is a fellow veteran. Um, she wants to discuss how drugs and alcohol have an impact on men and women in the military and the suicide rate. So, Amber? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name is Amber Viola. Um, currently, I am a student at Marywood and I work at Community Intervention Center which is a homeless shelter, a homeless day shelter in Scranton. And um, before I get started, I wanted to just tell you guys a story. Um, when I first became a victim advocate, I worked with, uh, they kind of have you under the wing of somebody else. And she told me a story about when she first became a victim advocate about a girl who went to a party. She had just got into the Marines. She was hanging out with what she thought were her brothers. Um, one of the people who had been there for a while told her, you know, hey, maybe it's not a good idea for you to go. Well, she went anyway, um, ended up getting beat up pretty bad and gang raped. And they said by the time they found her that it looked like she was covered in frosting. So when she went to her chain of command and told them what had happened to her, um, she got slapped with underage drinking because she was underage and she was drunk. And she smoked weed and so she also got hit with um, using drugs. Biggest part of, I think, recovery and accepting yourself and trying to change and trying to move forward is trust. And trust is a really big thing, and trust in your chain of command is another really huge thing in the military. And I think that's why a lot of people do not come forward with drug and alcohol issues because they don't trust their chain of command. They don't trust that the military is going to have their back. Um, that story isn't really about drugs. Um, but it's about how she went to do the right thing and they kind of stabbed her in the back. Now, eventually, because of so much hoopla and stuff, her charges ended up, they didn't even get dropped, they just didn't ever pursue them against her, but that happens a lot. Um, in order to understand substance abuse, we must understand the reason behind it. So in the military, um, during the Vietnam War, that was when they really saw how many soldiers were using drugs. So two stages of the Vietnam drug use were identified as first a period of increased marijuana use, which was during the 70s, you know, everybody was free love and stuff. And so we became really popular. The second was opioids and heroin. So about a fifth of the soldiers that came back from Vietnam were addicted to drugs and hardcore drugs. So once they got back here, they were using the drugs. And there was kind of a gateway between here and Vietnam that opened the, opened the floodgates for more heroin and stuff to come into the United States. So when this was happening, the military started to see, like, wow, we really have a drug problem. Before this, they I'm not going to say they didn't care, but they weren't really actively, like, kicking people out. And, it, you know, it wasn't really a, a big push to get people out. So with this new generation of veterans, we're doing spice, coke, opioids, and weed. So... Um, when I first joined the military, spice was a huge thing. It was made illegal, so people got kicked out for using it. I had never even heard of spice and didn't honestly even know what it was. Um, <laughs> so, spice is a synth synthetic marijuana or fake weed. Because of its chemicals, it hits you like marijuana, but the effects are sometimes very different and much stronger. Um, spice has called people to have seizures and have heart attacks. And people have had, like, have smoked spice and kind of have an episode and never went back to normal, ever. Um, at my job, I believe they've had, like, two people die of spice. I think they had one person pass out in our center and actually have seizures and stuff because of that. So when I first joined, I was on my first deployment, and a bunch of my friends finally got there from boot camp, and I was so excited. And literally, they all got kicked out within two months on our first deployment, about 20 people because they were all smoking spice. Somebody ended up telling on them and they all got kicked out. Um, in 2016, the army finally started keeping track of how many people they were kicking out due to drugs and they kicked out 6,000 people. 
So there are not really good numbers for drug use in the military because they don't really keep track of it. Um, you can get discharged for I mean, anything. So if your drug use falls under some type of you know, disobeying a lawful order, disobeying your chain of command, <laughs> Um, anything like that, it might not say drug use, so then it won't be calculated into the tally of, oh, these people got kicked out for drug use. I think that's definitely done on purpose. Um, I've had two friends that were kicked out for cocaine, two of my best friends in the Navy. One is doing really well right now, and the other one is not doing well at all. So they got kicked out because they were doing drugs with somebody else, and that person told on them. And they ended up having them all take a urinalysis test. One ended up popping. The other one didn't pop, and he would have got off, but he admitted that he did it, so both of them got kicked out. One of them got kicked out about three days before he was supposed to transfer, and the other one, like two weeks before he was actually getting out the Navy, um, he got kicked out. So it totally took away all his benefits. It took away his honorable discharge. Um, he had done eight years. It took away him being able to use his GI Bill once he got out. It took away everything. Um, both of them it did, but one it really affected more than others. So the military has a zero po tolerance policy for drug use, which on one hand sounds like it's super amazing. Like, yes, you know, you're going to hold everybody to the same standard. But when you have that zero tolerance, you're not giving people the support that they need. So if you're just kicking people out because they piss hot on the drug test or because they're drinking too much or whatever, what do you do once they get out? This is how you get into veteran homelessness because if you get kicked out for drugs, chances are you're not gonna be able to use your GI Bill, you're not gonna get any benefits for anything, you probably can't even use the VA all the way and get medication, um, you won't be able to get a VA home loan. Um, there's so much stuff that you just do not qualify for at all and these are the people that really need it. I hear so many people all the time ask me, well, how come the VA doesn't help veterans? And they do, but if you're a veteran that got yourself in trouble and got kicked out the military, they don't really count you. So they're the population that really, really needs help. Um, and they're the ones that aren't getting it. So the VA is supposed to nowadays be working on trying to overturn some of these convictions and make it so that people can go to the VA and use the services and different things like that, use rehab services, everything like that. So hopefully that helps and that happens because they're not focusing on what is the root cause? Why are people doing this? So when people were coming back from Vietnam, they had PTSD, they were in battle. We knew what they were doing. Now, a lot of the people that are using drugs and committing suicide in the military, they've never seen combat. They've never picked up a weapon besides in boot camp. Um, they haven't been to Iraq, they haven't been to Afghanistan, and they're dying at a really high rate. Um, about. 20 soldiers, sailors, and everybody kills themselves a day that are veterans. Last year, 346 active duty soldiers, sailors, and airmen all killed themselves. And these are people that were still in the service and not even just veterans. They haven't actually been tallying really well active duty suicides, but it's getting high and it actually might surpass the rate of veteran suicides pretty soon. Um, there was a, the USS um, Bush had two suicides in a week about a month ago, and then they had, I think their ship had maybe five suicides in the past few years. Their ship has been in dry dock. They're not even in the ocean. They're sitting somewhere where their ship is getting overhauled and redone, and these sailors are just depressed and anxious and taking their own lives. And I don't really feel like enough is being done about it, I don't feel like anybody's really asking the questions as to like, why are these, why is this happening? Especially why is this happening to people who aren't, you know, in the field? They're not shooting people every day. You know, they're not um, in the jungle. They're just going to work regular on a ship and they're having such high rates of killing themselves and they're having really high rates of drug use. Um, a lot of people are getting kicked out before they even, you know, get deployed or anything like that. And, um, they're trying to figure out why, but I feel like they're not really asking the right questions. A lot of people that get kicked out are the ones that don't have a good support system. They're the ones that end up homeless. 45% of all homeless veterans are African American, despite only accounting for about 12% of the population. Homeless veterans are younger on average than the total veteran population. 70% of homeless veterans also have substance abuse disorders. So. 
you have people that have real issues that are just living out on the streets, um, killing themselves, overdosing, overdosing, and we really need to, this is a population that really needs help. 63% um, of Afghanistan and Iraqi, Iraqi veterans, which would be veterans that are in like my generation, are diagnosed with substance abuse, also had PTSD. And those vets that had PTSD, um, there was a good amount of female vets who had been raped or sexually assaulted, and they suffer from MST, which is military sexual trauma. So if you have MST, you most likely have PTSD, and then you most likely have a substance abuse problem. It's kind of like a, a cascading effect. So MST, military sexual trauma, right now is not in um, the DSM, which means it doesn't count as its own specific disorder. That's something I'd really like to hopefully change in the future. So if you've been sexually assaulted and you have military sexual trauma, you almost have to get diagnosed with PTSD for you to be able to get help because everywhere doesn't accept uh, military sexual trauma as its own diagnosis. Um, so many people, though, who have it have had so many drug problems and alcohol problems. And um, I, one of my brother's friends was raped at gunpoint in Afghanistan for eight months almost every day. And she ended up getting pregnant and having an abortion. She went back, um, didn't tell anybody, didn't really do anything about it. She ended up gaining a ton of weight. So she got kicked out the military because she became overweight. She wasn't in fitness standards anymore. And so she got kicked out. So now she has all these issues that she was battling and dealing with. And she isn't able to have access to the same things that I'm able to have access with, with me using the VA, with me using my benefits and stuff, because she did get kicked out. And she's one of those, like I was saying before, one of the people that really, really need the benefits and that really need the help. And she, to me, is a perfect example of how you see how everything is so connected together. You can't take one part out without considering the whole. You have to consider all the nuance of everything around it. You have to consider rape in the military. You have to consider depression. You have to consider anxiety. You have to consider suicide. You have to consider drug use. You have to consider alcohol use. All of those things are so intertwined together that we can't really separate them. You almost have to tackle them on all head on so that we can stop suicide and we can stop people from overdosing. So I don't want you to think that the military won't help you at all if you have a substance abuse problem or uh, alcohol problem. They do. They offer rehabilitation services and things like that. But because of the zero tolerance policy, you almost have to get those things before you get in trouble. You have to be able to go to somebody that you trust, like I said in the beginning, and say, hey, I have this problem, and you have to trust in that person to not report you and for that person to actually really help you and for you to be able to keep your career. If you don't do that, then you end up with the whole issue of problems and you end up maybe getting kicked out and then you're not going to get any help. But for somebody to be able to go to somebody and in their chain of command and say, hey, I have a drug problem, I have an alcohol problem, they really have to have that trust. And that trust just isn't there right now. It's not there for people to report sexual assaults. It's not there for people to go to their chain of, man, chain of command and say I have an alcohol problem. It's not there for people to go to their chain of command and say that they have a drug problem. So we really need to continue to try to spread the word just about how interconnected all these things are, how interconnected the opioid crisis is to everything, and that the military isn't untouched. Um, active duty service members aren't untouched. Veterans aren't untouched. Um, the drug of choices are kind of different. I think it's probably just access to it. If you're on deployment, if you're on a boat, if you're somewhere far, you probably don't really have access to pills. It's probably easier to get a lot of other stuff. Um, but it's still happening, and people are still doing it, and a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of people are dying. I do not feel like we as a country are taking um, veteran suicide and active duty suicide as seriously as we need to be. I truly believe it is an epidemic, and I, it breaks my heart every single day when I see that so many of my fellow, fellow soldiers and sailors are dying. Um, the anniversary of an ex-boyfriend I had actually killed himself. The anniversary was last week. He was on my ship. Um, we hung out all the time. We had some pretty good weekends of just getting hotel rooms and drinking Jack Daniels. Um, but he ended up getting off the military and killed himself. He had a little girl, and I believe he had a wife. And he was young. He was my age, and, you know, and that was it. And there's so many people like that 
that we have to help and that we have to reach. So that's all I have. Thank you. Yay. Does anybody have any questions for Amber?